This is Sienna Leia, inviting you to join me tonight as we navigate through the seen and the unseen, explore external and internal realities, expose on-world and off-world agendas, discover a path to joy and freedom. Now, join me as we illuminate the Shadowland and reclaim our birthright as free and sovereign beings. All right, good evening. We're back for hour two of Illuminating the Shadowland. This is Sienna Lea, and I'm here with uh, my dear friend Evie Lorgan. Good evening, Evie. Um, good evening. Nice to be here again. And we are also here with Randy Kramer, Super Soldier of the U.S. Marine Corps Special Services, uh, working in a project Moonshadow. And since this uh, sort of material is uh, a specialty that you have in-depth understanding of, I am turning this over uh, to you, Evie, and I will be um, your backup. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you, Sienna. Um, I guess we, we just finished our first hour, and in that first hour, I don't know if we had gotten cut off a little bit on the, the tail end, um, but Randy Kramer actually um, was also known as Captain K in another interview that Michael Sala did, which is also, um, you know, the interview about his Mars Defense Force um, tour of duty and the Super Soldier Project. Um, so I have a lot of questions I'd like to ask, and I'm kind of overwhelmed with how much we can get in in one hour. Uh, so I think what we left off was we were talking about the different types of alien species on Mars that Randy was assigned to defend against um, for the protection of the Mars colony, which is primarily, I guess, why they were sent there. And so I think we was talking about the two different reptoid species, the difference between the two, and then also the insectoid species. So maybe we can get a little bit of a recap on those species that you defended against and interacted with on your Mars Defense Force. Randy, sure. maybe you can just go ahead and just say a little bit about that. Yeah. Sure. Um, the two native sentient species on Mars, other than the humans, were the reptoid species, who also known as the Galuk, which is a little hard to pronounce correctly because it's not pronounced in our language properly at all. Uh, and the in, an insectoid species um, who refer to themselves uh, more often than not as the she, uh, which both of those words roughly translate as to um, children of the home world, whatever you know, children of the mother world or children of the uh, of the planet. They're sort of you know similar translations from separate languages, which essentially mean the same thing, which really kind of mean what mean when you say you're an earthling, you know, you're a child of the earth or someone of the earth. It's a very similar kind of reference point when you're living on a planet to refer to yourself, your species as, you know, the children of or that planet. So, and the draconians uh, were visitors and they came from the outside. So they're certainly not a native terrestrial species to Mars and they got involved in the conflict over time. And, and um, it was essentially a, when it got, when it was really fully heated up, it was a three-way, four-way conflict between us, the insectoids, the she, the reptoid natives, the Galuka, and the uh, hostile outside draconians. I see. Wow. Yeah, so does it sound like that all the other species, the insectoid and the reptilian ones, were also defending against the dracos and perceived them as a threat? Well, and initially before the Dracos got involved, it was a, you know, what I would call sort of a natural order of conflict, which was where everyone was sort of stakes out of territory uh, because this is sort of the way things were already being done uh, by the native species. They stake out a territory, they stake out a perimeter of that territory and engage uh, with members of opposing groups and against and next to that territory. Uh, occasionally and often enough to sort of reduce aggression levels to nothing more than skirmishes. So you kind of sort of keep, you know, people on your, your opponents around you uh, from being able to build too big of, an, of a personal army or big too big of their forces so that, you know, you're, you're just kind of kept at this skirmish level constantly. Um, so I, it, that in and of itself was you know, annoying and ugly and traumatic and so forth whenever it could be, but I suppose really in perspective of things, 
that was kind of like the normal mundane rush to sell, not much really exciting happening sort of events, even though that's not really true, uh, as opposed to what started to happen when the Bretonians got involved, stepped up the tactics and the military sort of procedures on going from a, a, you know, a raiding and kind of territorial aggression system to something that was way, way, way more hostile and weapons of mass destruction were being used. And that got everybody mad. Oh. Up. And it was like, hey, why'd you do that? We were, you know, having a nice, you know, skirmish relationship. And then you dropped a nuclear bomb in our lap. We're not happy at you now. Um, so they really tried to escalate the conflict and get everybody fighting amongst themselves in a much more hostile and aggressive uh -huh. Way hoping to sort yeah. of unbalance the system and and be able to take over using that you know their divide and conquer kind oh. of mentality. And yeah. over time, I won't get into the whole story of this, but over time, uh, intelligence you know started to become clear that we weren't dealing with a singular reptoid species anymore, but we were dealing with a secondary reptoid species who was from outside of the planet, and that became a, a whole nother. Oh, that's what's going on. These guys are from somewhere else, and they're coming to storm the party. Okay. So that changed tactics. That changed sort of diplomacy, and that changed a lot of things. And so eventually, um, all three of the sort of terrestrial uh, Martian species, which at this point would have been the humans who were there and the native reptoids and the native insectoids, really made a treaty and got together and took on the Dracos three-on-one and kicked them off oh. Mars. So, yeah, it was a very interesting uh, event. That's and interesting. Was, and and I, I've I want to emphasize this, that it was a, a real learning experience to see someone, meaning the Dracos, who are perceived and often written in intelligence reports and briefings as this very fierce, practically unstoppable, unbeatable military force, and watching them get their clocks cleaned uh, by these native uh, Martian reptoids who just used them like mops and really, really just had them running terrified after a while. It was really interesting to see how this supposedly very, very strong, you know, egotistical, uh, nothing can defeat us, and then watch what happens when they get scared and something is bigger and stronger and more fierce than them and can chase them down. Um, so that was very interesting, and, and I think that it's not a small point that if we are making certain tactical decisions because we know that there is this draconian military machine that is stronger and bigger than anything we know how to deal with, we should first and foremost be communicating with the people who have the skills to beat them on the battlefield because obviously an ally that can beat them on the battlefield can beat them anywhere – um, the native Martians, the Galuka, really have no interest in doing anything off their own world. So they're, they're not necessarily interested without some kind of motivation and in getting involved in a larger conflict. But at the very least, at the very least, my understanding, their ability to provide training, uh, intelligence, and other information that could make us more formidable in the battlefield against the Dracos is a really, really key factor. Anyone who thinks that we're beaten because of these reptiles needs to understand that we have very, very close neighbors that can wipe the floor with them that we need to be communicating with deeply about, you know, more communicating, you know, peace treaty, being on the same side, ally situations where, you know, we have friends who can make their draconian bullying irrelevant. So the reptoid species that was pretty good at defense, um, which one were they? Because you said there was two major species on, on Mars of the reptoids, plus an out one, outside one coming in. So I'm wondering which I'm sorry, one. Me, yeah. I'm sorry, let me, let me clarify. Two reptoid species that were involved in the process, period, which was the native Martians, which are the Galuka, and then the okay. outworlders who were the Draconians, and the other native terrestrial species were insectoid, were the Shina. So uh, there are only two native intelligent terrestrial species, one reptoid, one insectoid, and then an outsider reptoid species who are the draconians, and then the humans. Oh, okay. So which and ones are the ones a lot involved? Of points. It can get complicated. I'm happy to clarify. Yeah. Well, I'm curious about which ones were involved with the collusion with the 
I guess it would be the Project Moonshadow um, in the programming uh, and training of the people. Yeah, completely different reptoid species there. Uh, also uh, known either as, you know, the brawn ones or the children of Lee. I think I'm trying to figure out better terminology to use, and I think we can put a hyphen and call them the Leons and try and sort of figure hmm. out something like that, try and make it simple. Uh, but that's a completely different reptoid species that had nothing to do with anything that was happening on Mars, uh, to my oh. knowledge. And they, were, they were nowhere hmm. near there, were nowhere near involved, had nothing to do with it. Um, certainly, they're very subtle the way that they interact with things. So any interaction that they would have had with Mars, I certainly may not have even been aware of or nobody would have really had good intelligence on because they're, they're subtle. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, so uh, what did you find out was the major weakness of the Dracos that could be useful for us to know? I mean, since they are such a problem for many people. Um, I'd say that their main weakness is their hubris. Um, and their ego thinking that they're undefeatable is, is their main weakness, it's their main flaw, so that anytime there is a weakness that can be exploited, they're not going to be as readily prepared to deal with that as they might be. They're incredibly arrogant. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, they, they're, they're, they're a big bully who no one has really been able on a large scale to challenge them, so why change? I, I heard someone put it that way once, and I think it was a very intelligent way of putting that. If you are the big bully in the galaxy and no one can really take you on, why change? So their motivation to change is pretty much zero uh, without anyone to change their behavior. But that means that they're not really as good as they think they are. They're just bullies. So they're not really as smart as tactically as they think that they are, and they're not really as brilliant militarily as they think they are. Um, they just happen to have some really powerful technology, and they're very strong, and they're very developed. Uh, but that doesn't make them yeah. undefeatable. It does not make them invulnerable. It makes them very weak mentally, actually. I mean, they're, I mean, they're very psychically strong, but they're very weak mentally because of their ego mm. and because of their hubris. They really don't have a kind of metaphysical connection which really gives them strength, which is why they have to rely on a lot of external technology and a lot of, you know, forceful domination because – if they really tried to live in harmony with their, if they really tried tomorrow to live in harmony with their universe, they simply wouldn't be evolved enough to do so. So as one person pointed out to me, an interesting distinction between them and us is they are an older, more developed species, but we are a more evolved species, just less developed, if you understand what that means. So, okay, well, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah they're reptiles and we're mammals. So no matter what, how you want to shape that up, we are more evolved. It just so happens that their particular reptoid species has been evolving longer than our human species. So they're more developed but less evolved. So ultimately they're, they are weaker than us. Um, it's just at the moment, you know, they're kind of like um, another metaphor that I think is appropriate. You know, they're the 72-year-old creepy uncle and we're the 7-year-old niece you know, in the family, and we're getting molested by them because we're not yeah. developed. Yeah. You know, I we're wonder, more did, you, did you notice, like, um, any, like, energy vampirism behaviors by any of these alien species with your interactions? Or, I mean, it's kind of an added question. We hear so much about the interdimensional aspects of, let's say, reptilians who overshadow people and that they're really interdimensional and they're not physical, but... In your instance, they're definitely physical. This is not some interdimensional thing where they're just hosting people or some paranormal weird stuff. This is like real physical battle. Is that oh, true? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, yeah, we're on the ground on the Martian plateau on the red sand in, you know, powered battle armor fighting, you know, hordes of very angry uh, lizard men. I mean, it's, it was a really bloody, fierce screaming, shouting, things throwing, exploding, fire, battle. It was very physical. Uh, and I can tell you, having been wounded many, 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 many times and had caustic things spit in the face of my helmet and other things many, many, many times, is a very, very real physical conflict we're talking about for sure. Uh -huh. They certainly okay. have abilities to do other things and be multidimensional and so forth, but in this case, yeah. we're absolutely talking about what it was a very, very real physical conflict. Yeah, because so many people don't think aliens are really physical beings. They think it's, it's all, they're all demons, basically. 
or right. you know the ones that overshadow people. So this is sure. you know adds a physical dimension of reality to it. Definitely. Yeah, and my understanding is um, there are certain species which, as they evolve technologically, the understanding that the ability to sort of be fluid in dimensional space is, is a technological awareness. Um, so as they grow technologically, not necessarily mentally, they can evolve the ability to maneuver dimensionally. We are scientists are learning how to maneuver dimensionally without being evolved enough to maneuver dimensionally. So technology can circumvent and uh, supplant many, many, many other right brain personal technology that doesn't make them better. It doesn't mean we're going to use them more responsibly at all, but it does mean that there are plenty of things that we think of as being sort of, you know, evolved mental developed uh, evolutions, which eh, not necessarily. Sometimes you just have to be smart enough or know how to build the machine that enhances that ability or changes that frequency or, or does the job for you. So lots of technologies yeah. and tools that do the jobs for you when you're talking about multidimensional action or travel. So plenty of ETs who have the ability to maneuver in that space, some of them that seem to live more in that space than we do, um, but in this particular case, we're definitely talking about interacting in a real third dimensional physical space where we're all together fighting and killing one another. Wow. So in terms of the, the third dimensional um, physics and chemistry of Mars, did you know, let's say, where you got your water source or what the soil was like? Did they have, um, I don't know, what was the weather like? Could you stay out in the outside for long? And I don't know if you've heard of Andrew Basagio's accounts of being teleported on Mars on the surface as well as underground. And had, I don't know if you've run into these unusual predatory species, which they weren't like the reptoids or the insectoids. They were more of a lower animal I don't know what they were, but they were hostile, predatory creatures. Oh, sure. Supposedly sure. on the surface. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, sure. So yeah, I mean, there's, uh, yeah, sure. I'll be happy to see if I can answer that. Um, well, uh, Andrew Basaggio, I've heard the name. I, obviously, I keep hearing his name. I need to, you know, look up his work and read some of the things that he's published and talked about. Uh, but I have, at this point, not heard anything that he said or read anything that he said, so I don't know. When you refer to him, I, I don't know anything about what he's already stated about his experience on Mars, so I can't comment directly to that. I will, I'll be looking into that. What I can say is um, that the weather is variable. The temperature is variable. Uh, it can be pretty extreme depending on the season, depending on the time of day, depending on various uh, motions of the air currents, depending on, you know, high pressure systems, low pressure systems, you know, depending on whether you're getting a high pressure system coming in from the southern desert or a low pressure system coming in from the Arctic north can absolutely depend on the difference on whether you're outside and it's 79 or whether it's negative 22 or more, negative 100 or something. I mean, the temperature can oh. be extreme. Um, this is why we had, you know, in completely sealed up, you know, environment suits is because while you can wow. breathe the very thin air uh, out there and while you can survive uh, on the surface under the right, you know, temperature conditions, just like here, you know, you step outside in the wrong place at the wrong time of the wrong time of the year, you could freeze to death or cook in a couple of hours. So uh, Mars yeah. is no different in that sense. It just has some more extreme weather, some even more extreme cold and more extreme heat. Um, it's not very stormy. Um, you know, I'll say that much about it. The atmosphere is still fairly thin. So you know, you don't get a lot of cloud cover. You don't get a lot of, you know, windstorms or cyclones or anything like that. It's, it's fairly, I mean, the weather's not nearly as exciting there as it is here. I'll, I'll say that. It's much more boring okay. and much more minimal than it is here. We have a lot more weather here, for sure. Um, yeah, I would imagine it might get boring after a while actually being in, in some kind of enclosure for 20 years, you know, or not being... Yeah, just having to stay in a limited area. I mean, what did you guys do for entertainment if you even could such a thing? Well, um, well oh, sure. No, I mean, the, the, the interesting and sort of workable side of that uh, are the, the simulators, the training simulators, um, oh. which are, are also, you know, sort of perfectly during non-training time and off-duty time can be used for recreational purposes. So, um, it, 
Now, it, when I say simulator, I mean it, it, it is a, a complete immersive virtual simulator, uh, but you know you have to hook up to it. So there's like a there's a soft hat with all these tr electrodes on it that you have to put on, and there are these big gloves, like mittens, I call them, that you have to put on that look like big giant oven mitts that have these sensors in them for your hands and your fingers, and um, mm. kind of lean up against this squishy. Uh, surface that kind of holds you in a kind of a stand-up position and then you know you're pulled in sort of this computer virtual simulation environment where um, the rate of time flow is different so it, it would not be uncommon to go do a training session and spend 8, 10, 12 hours doing a training session and then come out of the simulator and realize that only three hours of chronological time oh, boy. Has yeah. So the ability to train more hours, uh, you know, in sort of per second, you know, that you normally could in chronological time, uh, which is kind of an advantageous as far as training purposes is concerned. Uh, but it also means that, you know, like I said, in downtime, you know, you can use it as a, a it was recreational simulator. So, you know, we could spend a certain amount of time doing or being whatever was loaded up into the simulator and sometimes, I mean, you could run programs from back home and go walk in the grassy field on earth or something. I mean, it's, you know, sort of holiday mm -hmm. kind of thing. Um, yeah. and, and as well as some other, what I, you know, some of the more interesting um, sort of simulations that I thought were not of earth or of Mars were, but some other places that they had data stored into that I thought was interesting to sort of virtually be in places in space and other planetary surfaces that you couldn't walk on uh, probably because of the yeah. gravity of the things, but were really fascinating to sort of experience in a simulator experience. So uh, in that sense, you get, you know, to feel like you're not just locked up, you know, in the building and in the horseshoe the whole time. And I will often yeah. refer to the horseshoe because it's got a horseshoe shape to it. Um, but, you know, we're outside probably on a daily basis too. So, uh, oh, okay. and yeah, and it's, you know, the, um, you know, the sun shines a lot on Mars. It's a sunny place, to be honest. So, oh. you know, kind of just getting to go outside. Even though the sun's far away, believe it or not, it's still fairly bright there, you know. And when you step outside, mm -hmm. you still know that you're stepping outside and you still get this feeling of like, oh, I'm outside, the sun, nice. Um, so <laughs> it was you – know, I, I won't say that it was the easiest thing in the world to, you know, live in a large underground facility where that's where you spend most of your time. But it wasn't like living, you know, in a cave or in a facility that was really locked down or what we felt imprisoned in because, again, the simulators and we were outside on a fairly regular basis. Yeah. Okay. Oh, now, so one, maybe one you, you were asking about the teleportation. So, uh, I do, again, I'm going to oh, look okay. up and see what Andrew's thing is about the teleportation program because I've heard some interesting things about that. What I know is that uh, over time, the ability for us to use what I would call localized wormhole technology, which is very like uh -huh. small, personal, sort of localized wormhole travel, um, we, I know that we were able to do that, so I will look up in what exactly when he's referring to a teleportation system, if he's really referring to some sort of matter transmutation, you know, dissolvation, reformation, yeah. teleportation, or whether he's talking about a localized wormhole kind of teleportation program. I'll be really curious to know the details about that. But at some time uh, after a few years, after probably by the fourth or almost the fifth year when I was there, we started using the localized wormhole as a transportation system. So oh, uh, definitely use that. Hmm. Uh, and on the surface, there are a number of critters, uh, small and a few large ones. Uh, most of them are buried okay. diggers that dig in the sand and dig underground. And um, there are some larger critters, you know. I mean, some larger reptiles and some larger – I mean, I, I – mean, I, got fur, it's got claws, that seems like it's probably a mammal to me, so a, a furry dick mm -hmm. is probably a mammal, but I don't know what you would, you know, I mean, it wasn't, these were not things that we spent a lot of time talking about that weren't like experts in our division on, you know, Martian zoology or something that would say, oh, that's okay. a So I, I have no yeah. idea what, you know, you would call these things. We would just call them, you know, that's a furry digger, that's a scaly digger, that's an ugly digger. Um, or that looks like a squirrel, or, you know, that looks like a bird, or, you know, that looks like a hmm. sperling. Um, you know, it's interesting to see similar animals that you're like, well, that 
looks like a bird. I mean, I, I, I'm not sure if I can completely recognize the patterning or the feathers, but wow, that looks like a bird to me. And, well, that looks like a bird and that looks like a furry yeah. digger. So, I mean, it's, it's, these are things that certainly you could say were similar to animals yeah. that are here on Earth. But also not being a zoologist and having seen every animal on Earth, I couldn't really compare and say, oh, that's exactly or somewhat like this or that. I really can't say. Uh, but there's absolutely all kinds of critters, and some you don't want to get too close to, but keeping in mind that I was usually traveling with a group of people in heavy body armor and arms, so not too much that we're yeah. afraid of as far as animals on the surface when you're prepared like that. Yeah, right. Okay. Okay, yeah, we're going to go mean, to a little break. Uh, okay. Well, no, we have about a minute. Um, okay. Just yeah, maybe you we can... Um, I'm just curious about the, the conflict that occurred. It was actually the big one where you went to invade a underground reptilian temple. And maybe you could talk a little bit about that when we return about what happened and why, you know, they wanted to do that and what they found or if they found anything. Um, sure. I, I, I think, I mean, there's a couple different stories that I'm thinking of that you could be Okay, well, we're going to take a little three-minute break, Randy, and we'll be back in three minutes. Stay with us. This is Illuminating the Shadowlands. Our guests, Randy Kramer and Evie Lorkin. We'll be right back. Welcome back. This is Sienna Leia, and you're at Illuminating the Shadowlands. Uh, we're going to just keep going here with Evie and Randy. Uh, this is incredibly mind-blowing and fascinating stuff. Evie? Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. Yeah, I'm trying to think of some really good questions to ask since we don't really have a lot of time. But there's so much to cover like with respect to Randy's experience. It's pretty phenomenal. I just wanted to reiterate that he's one of the rare few that actually has remembered and recovered as much as he has maintaining sanity and really doing his own healing and recovery process, which of course, that's one of the things that I'm really interested in because I run into a lot of people who think they're in a project or they're remembering things, but they, it's so spotty and they don't really have evidence or they have a really hard time putting things together and maintaining balance in their life, you know? So I guess one of the things I wanted to ask, too, was um, anything that you could remember in terms of technology and your memory of the experience of when you were age regressed after the end of your tour of duty, what they did to actually regress you and suppress memories and, like, you know, where did you wake up when you were done, basically? What did you remember? Sure. Um, I will answer that question to the best of my ability, um, which – is as well as I can remember based on, you know, whatever drugs they were giving us um, to sort of, you know, the anesthetic drugs, um, you know, various kinds of drugs that you're giving people for medical procedures and to, keep, you know, keep them tranquilized and so forth. And probably some of the sort of anesthetics that are used to sort of block memory and so forth. So it's a little fuzzy, but what I can remember is, uh, after finishing my tour of duty um, on Mars and I got promoted and was on the Nautilus for a few years and then after I uh, finished my 20-year tour, was sent back to uh, Luna Operations Command and to the medical facility there uh, where what seemed like must have been at least two or three weeks um, of physiological changing procedures, operations, what seemed like, as well as some debrief, 
um, some conversations with an intelligence person, intelligence officer talking about, you know, going back for your second life and like, don't worry, you'll go back and everything will be fine and we'll got it all taken care of, which is just a shine on. I've heard other people tell this story now the same way that I, I really feel confirmation about this, that every time they sit you down to debrief you when you're going back, it's like, no, don't worry, everything will be fine. We'll totally take care of you. And then, no, not at all. It's just kick you to the curb and see if we can flush you down the toilet kind of a thing, which is, uh, again, my chain of command thinks this is a terrible, horrible way to treat the soldier class and that it should not be an acceptable form of uh, use and material of our soldiers. It just should not be acceptable. But essentially what I remember is, uh, now I, I've tried to figure this out and I've tried to meditate and remember this the best that I can because I've often wondered with my physical body, wow, did they actually physically age reverse my older body or did they just put me into a younger clone body and then decide that that was good it would appear that what took several weeks of preparation time different procedures was a process of moving my consciousness just back into a younger clone body because it was more efficient it was easier and more efficient instead of actually going through all the trouble that you would have to go through to change the physiological cellular structure of an older body, but to actually just put you in a younger clone. It's just much simpler that way, I think. Uh, most of the other mm. procedures were about the memory suppression and uh, different sort of debriefing protocols so that when certain things would happen, uh, you'd have certain responses to them, including you know, like a sort of suggestive uh, programming protocol that if you remember, you'll go mad. So that's another oh, reason yeah. why most people, when they start to have memories, they start to feel like they're going crazy because there's sort of a subcommand yeah. protocol that if you remember, you'll go yeah. mad. So um, what you just have to remember, and I would just say this to anybody who's going through an experience, several things you have to remember. One is that of course they're trying to stop you from remembering. So if it feels like you're moving against a force that's trying to prevent you from remembering and mm -hmm. doing what you're doing and being healed, you're right. You're not delusional or crazy to think that there is a physical, natural force that is trying to stop you from progressing because there yeah. is. Um, you have to work against that force. You have to be stronger mentally than that force. You have to keep at it and never, ever, ever, ever give up because the second that you give up, you lose. Um, the other thing that I want to suggest and make a point of is that as a person is going through the process of remembering things, there's going to also be things that are purposefully incorrect and purposefully misleading that you will remember that are designed to lead you on a wrong path, on a long path, wrong path of remembering uh, and confabulation. And um, I will say... Can you give that, an example of... I'm just curious um, if you can give an example of that that you recognize as a distraction or confabulation program, you know? Um, trying to see if I can think of a specific case. Um, well, you might have had one happen to you and then you realize, oh, uh, that's not the truth, well, you know, there was something let, else, you know? Let, let me... Let me go from A to C on that one, which is as I was going through this process, I was certainly not sure what I was remembering was accurate, whether it was true, um, which parts of it might be accurate or true and which parts might not be. So after what really was years of, you know, what I would call the initial discovery period was years. And when I finally got to a point where I said, okay, I can definitively say something really something very, very strange and unearthly is going on here. Like I could finally come to that conclusion, like given all the data that I had, even if I wasn't going to try and jump to any other conclusions, I could conclude that. And once I got to that conclusion, I made a choice. And that choice was that I was going to absolutely get to the truth. And my methodology for choosing that was a process of meditation where I agreed with myself and my higher self, today I will start meditating twice a day, this was about 10 years ago, or 13 years ago, I said, I will start today meditating twice a day, every day for one year with total discipline, without skipping a day, without skipping a session, and every single time that I sit down to meditate, I will ask myself the same question every single time, uh, which, you know, 300 and, I don't know, it's like 365 times two, you know, it's 
620 some, uh, you know, 20 times or whatever, uh, I asked myself the same question, which was, I want to know the whole truth, truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help me God is alive, and I want to know what happened. I want to know what really happened. And then every time I would ask myself that in meditation, and I feel like I would get an answer or a vision or, or, or some kind of clarification, my response was, no, I refuse to accept that, and then I would do the same thing at my next session, and I did that, you know, 600 and some times in a row, saying, I want the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and then whatever you give me, I'm going to say no. I'm going to reject immediately. And the reason for that is that unless you say no to something enough times to be sure that it's absolutely correct, you can't be sure. And what I can know is that I said no over 600 times to this in the period of a year, twice a day, every day, in which the same answer the same message, the same images, the same memories kept coming forward every time. So to make sure that I wasn't getting a false image or I wasn't confabulating anything, I would just say, nope, I don't think you're telling me the truth. I'm going to ask again later, and I'm going to want the truth next time. And I just kept doing that and asking that until after a year, I was certain I had the truth. So I would recommend to anyone who's not sure. You have to be dedicated. You have to be more dedicated than any other person you know on how you're going to get through this because any other person you know has obviously not had to go through this and is not dedicated enough to get through it. So if you want to get through it, yeah. you have to have the dedication to get through it, and you have to be willing to ask yourself those questions and be willing to not accept the first thing that you're given uh, in order to know that you're getting past anything that might be false to get to the truth. So. I know people who accept the first thing, and they're, they need to come back to a sense of clarity and truth about themselves because they've decided, oh, I'm going to just, my intuition is right. I'm going to accept that first thing. And now intuition can be wrong. It can be incorrect the first time. Mm -hmm. And we mm -hmm. have a psychology and an emotional <clears throat> system that sets us up for all kinds of, I don't know if I want to do that. I don't know if I want to think yeah. that. I don't know if I want to believe that. I don't know if I want to accept that. So you have to really not just mentally, you know, appear in your frontal lobe, say, I'm dedicated to this. You have to make sure that you're dedicated in every cell of your body and your emotions yeah. are dedicated to the process. Otherwise, you'll be scared away. You will be frightened away. Yeah, you will plus, be intimidated mm -hmm. and you will be in our, in our earlier interview, I remember we did one many years ago when we were just coming out and used the pseudonym. We called it Zed, was your pseudonym name. And you had mentioned, you know, the the process you were going through in the recovery, it was as if you were set against many forces, including what you felt were, were Draco programming and reptilian programming to basically keep you from the truth. And, you know, like a severe, some pretty severe things were, were going off as booby traps in, in terms of, you know, um, horrible emotions and, uh, you know, suicide feelings and uh, all kinds of things. So, I mean, what would you say to someone who was, you know, just starting their process, what would you offer them to tell them what to do to find the truth? First thing you have to do is you just have to stay true to yourself. Um, other people might want to tell you what you should do, how you should think, or how you should figure it out, and they can't know. You, you have to be able to figure yeah. it out. Um, I consider myself at this time a pretty good detective, but not because I wanted to be a detective, but because I had to be a detective, I had to learn how to be a detective. I had to learn how to look for clues, track down clues, ask the right questions, be willing to disregard certain information and certain data and know when to not ask certain questions. Really, you have to learn to be your own detective about who am I, what am I, what have I been through, and what do I have to do to be whole again and to fix it. Um, and you just have to kind of keep those questions simple and try and keep the process simple because there's always going to be an attempt to distract you from that process. So keep it simple about knowing who you are, knowing what you are, knowing, you know, what you have to do to attain wholeness and to figure out, you know, how to come to your own sense of peace. And it, it's, it's going to be difficult. I'm not going to sugarcoat for anybody and say, ah, no problem. No, it's going to be hard. It's going to be really hard. But the alternative is more mental anguish, more mental and emotional and spiritual suffering, and more slavery and more negativity. So you kind of can either yeah. 
<clears throat> lay down and take it, or you can get up and fight. That's really it's it's that much of a polar kind of choice. You you either yeah. take it, you get up and fight back. Yeah, but fighting back that question means is kind of being really mentally <clears throat> strong. Well, yeah, it means the strength that we need even to deal with what's presenting itself. Obviously, why why they would create even some soldiers if if that's true that they want to create people who are strong enough to defend against some pretty horrific and strong, powerful non-human forces. Um, oh, yeah. I wanted to ask too if if you had you know run into any uh, like Nazi connections in your program in terms of the secret te technology, the breakaway civilization that you feel were absolutely connected to, let's say a breakaway Nazi faction that you know, use the technology and here they are today kind of thing. Do you feel that there was a strong Nazi connection other than what we know about the whole paperclip thing and the MK Ultra programs, but did you, you know, run into anything that you felt was like a direct Nazi connection? Um, yes, uh, but I would say where that connection and where that evolution has gone to um, is, um, it's really continued to be and more and more focused a conversation about eugenics and eugenics policy. Um, and okay. let me put it this way. The question is not whether or not we will use eugenics to make a better soldier class and a better elite, you know, breakaway civilization class. That's not the question. The question is not whether or not we will use eugenics to do that. The question is what kind of eugenics policy will we have to do that? Um, and this is where you have the split um, between the pure strainers and the T2ers. And the T2ers are essentially uh, the sort, you know, what you would call the sort of Nazi arm, which is let's uh, mix uh, recessive traits together in order to get a more random quality of mutations in order to uh, pull out the best of those mutations that you want to utilize and then cull the rest. And cull the rest is a nice way of saying you eliminate, destroy, or terminate all of your other test subjects that you find to be inadequate. Now, as a gardener, uh, using T2 uh, genetics to garden and to farm is perfectly fine. But when you're using T2 uh, genetics to deal with people, that's a bit more problematic because, you know, if I got to cull some plants out of a, a set, you know, to kill out some weak ones, that's not a very big deal. If I got to kill off a bunch of weak people because I think that they're inferior, we have a much more serious moral and ethical dilemma. Uh, the pure strainer argument is you just take the best qualities and you keep interacting them and you keep interbreeding them until eight generations later you have, you know, the sort of a pure strain uh, evolved genetic subject. So the split is between do we have a really serious ethical standard for our eugenics, our top secret eugenics projects, which are going to happen. Anyone who says, you know, well, we have to stop eugenics, no, it's not going to happen. You're not going to stop eugenics projects ever. It's never going to happen because science tells us that that is the better way to make a better person, period. So the question is not whether we're going to do that or not, it's how. And so the argument becomes between these Nazi T2ers and these pure strainers on how we should go about doing that. And that creates these much larger arguments about population control and whether you just wipe out a section of the population, especially of the worker and the underclass that you don't think is genetically necessary that you want to cull out of the system versus those who would say, no, 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 let's, you know, have a more humane attitude about how we're going to deal with everybody and try and genetically mix the things that we want to mix and move them down the direction we want to move and then realize that all of these other inferior genetics that we don't want, they're going to die. We don't have to starve them and kill them and, and you know, cull them. They're going to die in a generation. They just won't be here anymore. So there is a way to transition, you know, without just having to murder everybody uh, as a way of sort of dealing with what you consider to be the inferior genetic samples. So, but it, this yeah, where the I mean, it seems like there's, yeah, there's then, definitely then people who are being followed, yeah, and watched that they're above and beyond them, like the Milab super soldier programs or the abductees. But that's one thing that I'm finding in my work is that there's certain people who are definitely being watched and interfered with throughout their lives in all these unusual ways that, that it's just hard to imagine what's really happening on these higher levels of whoever's watching 
the bloodlines. And I sometimes think it's it's non-humans, like maybe it's the Dracos, maybe it's another line that they're just watching certain lines and have great interest in certain people. But it's like they're trying to stop us, too, from evolving to our full potential, either that that's or great, providing the, yeah. Right, that's a great question. I'd love to answer to that real quickly. Uh, my understanding is of the species who are involved in interacting with us that the number one goal or sort of attitude or premise that these species are, are, are going with is one of what can we do with the genetics? And it really depends on then what the goal of said group is, which is do we wish to alter these genetics in a way that's good for the species? Do we wish to alter these genetics in a way that's good for us to keep this species uh, enslaved or as a worker class or as a subclass? Yeah. Or is there some other genetic use for this person or their soul or whatever it is that about them that we can sort of use or capitalize on uh, for some other purpose? So my understanding is you'd be completely correct to presume that there are a number of extraterrestrial species and including our own, you know, elite sort of covert military presence who are very interested in genetics. In fact, um, yeah. I have said, in fact, if, if I am to say it's about one thing and one thing only, it's about genetics. Like if we were really to sum up this conversation of what this is all about and what is the main thing that's happening here, it's genetics. Okay. So what about the soul? Did you ever have any observation of soul theft and soul capturing or that genetic plus soul combination of, of interest? With these um, beings, I, I wouldn't say that I've personally observed that. I would say that in my personal process of undercovering what's going on with me and what happened with me in my own sort of situation with my body and my soul, I have come to understand that there is a technology uh, which is available, which allows people who have this technology to maneuver souls from uh, bodies to containers to other bodies into clone bodies and so forth. So. Um, there is absolutely a component uh, and a technological way in which you access this component of the soul in which the soul stops being this magical, mystical, spiritual, untouchable thing by technology, and it really just becomes another thing which can be touched upon and integrated and used with technology. So, um, hmm. Yeah, so it's kind of it was kind of creepy to me, really, uh, to think that a yeah. little bit. But it's also, you know, I try and just be accepting of what's real when we talk about science and technology. Uh, and so I just kind of have to, well, okay, if that's where we're at with that, that's where we're at with that. Uh, my experience and understanding and briefings on that is that people should be careful with their souls. Um, you yeah. know, you, yeah. you should be careful what you put in. You should be careful what you let out. You should be careful who you let in. You should be careful who you intermingle and mix with. Um, yeah, yeah, right. But beyond that, um, you know, everybody who's got a soul, which I know this could be a very controversial thing to say, but my understanding is that not every single person who stands on this planet has one. Um, yes, and I'm that's not what even I wondered about. I'm not even going to try and get into the criteria of what I think may or may not be, or what I've been told may or not be, why someone has a soul or doesn't have a soul. I'm not even going to get into that conversation. Uh, but <laughs> okay. I am, I, I am to understand what I understand correctly. Not every single person, when they're born, has one. Well, that's how I've understood it too. And of course, that's that's definitely a touchy subject. And I think we're close to our second hour. And so I'm thinking we're giving the choice. If we want to go for an extra half hour, we can. So um, are you open to talking another half hour, or yeah, should we I've bring this to a close? I've got time. I can do another half hour. Okay. I'd, I'd love to. I mean, this is my favorite subject, of course, the whole soul thing. And this is something that I've run across with the alien abduction research and correspondence with people like Dr. Corrado Malanga and his colleagues and other experiencers who, let's say, had experiences where they were you know, taken out of the body, for example, by certain alien beings or they were taken out of body or, or in the body onto a craft or some location where there's alien technology and then inserted into some kind of container or cylinder where it vibrates really quickly and then it basically forces the soul out of their body and then their body, their soul actually goes into another container or alien body or a clone body, so, right. or the black box thing. And then so 
I've heard people talk about the soul recycling technology, and I mean, I can go on and on, but I know there's something to this, and I also know that uh, I believe, let's say, I just believe that those aliens and entities that will feed on our life force, and there's a kind of energy vampirism that takes place, let's say, what I call in the alien love by it in the dark side of Cupid, for example, that right. the beings who do that, I question whether or not they have a soul because what they're trying to access is what they do not have that we have. And so I think that has to do with soul, but then it goes into what is the definition of soul based on what culture and what religion we're talking about. So in my mind, I guess there's soul and there's spirit, and then there's Malanga's definitions. And so I guess we have to get clear on what's our definition yeah. of what and, we and call and soul. To, yeah, and if I'm to understand correctly, there is a difference. Like, like if you're really wanting to talk about spirit or soul, th those are not the same thing, that they are sort of two different aspects of your personality and of your being. So, um, but I, it's an area which um, I think I understand. Uh, I cannot say with definitive authority that I understand it. All I can say is that I think I understand it. Um, and it seems it's a good question whether these ETs have a soul and that's why they're experimenting or, or trying to extract or use people's souls for something that yeah. is an interesting mm -hmm. there's a couple interesting theories going around about that uh, I think there's another yeah. interesting theory about those who may have gotten their souls corrupted and think that by har you know harvesting the energy of other people's more pure souls they can somehow you know untaint oh. and untarnish uh, the corruption of the souls that has either that they've either done themselves or has been done to them by someone else. So um, yeah, I mean, I kind of think that's part of the whole. I know it sounds biblical, but the, the fallen ones who let's say they fell from grace because they chose to disconnect from the divine source somehow, and then through that disconnection became more and more corrupted because they didn't have that innate connection that gives them the wisdom and the energy to um, function on that higher level. And so then they, they, they're starved for it, and then they want to either corrupt others as, as like a psychopathic side result, or they want to suck off those energies for people who are still connected to the divine source. So that seems to be what a lot of this energy vampirism is and, you know, what a lot of the false gods are doing, in my opinion. That makes perfect sense. But that's very diverse, yeah. Yeah. Mm. I don't know. Go ahead. I didn't really hear what you said. I kind of overstepped you oh, No, I was you saying there. That, that completely makes sense to me. I, I was agreeing with you um, that, that that completely makes sense. But um, it's it's an area which um, can easily get confused. I, I know that a lot of people think they understand when they talk about the soul or the spirit what they're talking about, and I think most people don't. They don't have proper definitions about those things. Um, yeah, so, right. Yeah, so it's a difficult thing to talk about and to bring clarity to, uh, but there, it's yeah. a factor. It's a factor. So, uh, and and genetics are a factor in that again as well. Like they're, it's very not much so. Thing. Yeah, they're not a separate thing. So somehow, mm -hmm. wherever and however the soul and the spirit come into there, also connected to the genetics in a very, very, very significant yes, way. Yes, very much so. It's like like the original. Let's say if there was an original G DNA of the human genetics without the, let's say, the Nephilim who got involved, let's say the fallen ones came and they interbred with some original DNA species, then the DNA was somehow corrupted from that time forward. There's probably, we're all hybrids at some point, but that corruption may have made it more difficult for us to not only have longevity, but to connect innately to the divine essence so that we have this innate, these innate abilities that maybe saints have, for example and that um, they corrupt it so that we have a denser and denser connection so it's harder for us to connect with God and therefore it's easier for us to go after the false gods who are offering all these other things because we lost the connection somehow. And it just makes me wonder because of what Malanga had discovered in his research and a lot of it was discovered actually through speaking to what he calls the purest divine essence of someone when we take them through a hypnotic regression and do like an integration between mind, spirit, and soul and then, then got answers about the true nature of some of these alien parasites and why they were taking us. So it's quite right. controversial because I know some people think, well, my aliens are really good and, you know, they've helped me and I think, you know, they're benevolent. And so I don't like getting into those kinds of arguments or discussions. I just find it interesting that there really is something about the DNA in that um, one of the things that Malanka said was that if, if we had too much of the alien DNA in us, 
that our DNA will actually reach, our soul will reject the DNA so that there would be less of a connection there. And then more ease of alien parasitism or hosting, for example. So mm -hmm. that's some of the for things sure. that I think David Icke might have talked about through his connections with some of this whole Illuminati bloodline thing and the reptilian hybrids is that when they hybridize them, they have more and more of this other genetic component which allows them to become more easily, let's say, hosted by uh, these reptile-type beings or dragon beings or whatever they are. And that's what some people claim to observe, you know, when they're around these, quote, shapeshifters. But that's like a whole different thing compared to, like, these physical entities that you're literally battling in a 3D environment. That, that's totally different. You know, this is like a, a spiritual, quasi-spiritual genetic thing going on. Um, sure. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, those, those are two, two different levels of the chessboard, you know, as, as I would call them, that are under yeah. play. Um, wh what I would comment to that is, um, as per my briefings with uh, the USMC special section, um, since the beginning of the human species on this planet, which goes back apparently, you know, about some like 400, 450,000 years or something like that. Um, mm -hmm. Homo Homo sapiens or whatever is about 450,000 years. Um, that at that that since that time, the intermingling of no less than 22 or 23 other extraterrestrial species have intermingled wow. with human earthling terrestrial DNA. So mm -hmm. um, you have a such a mix right now that depending mm -hmm. on exactly which genetic line, you know, your genetic line may go back and be attached to and which offshoot lines that may attach to, to how many different species or which species seems to be a factor on value as uh, a genetic sample. So, mm, yeah. Um, yeah, and and it's complicated in the sense that um of at least those 22 species or more, they all lay a certain legal claim to uh the people who have their genetic material and or the planet or portions of the planet as per, you know, sort of seeded or lived on by members who have their DNA. It ends up being this sort of complicated intergalactic legal argument that I don't I'm not qualified oh, to talk about. I see. But, um, yeah. but there are a number of species who are quite literally here not just going, hey, we're gonna do what we want, but they're like, hey, we have a right to be here because our people are be here, our children you know, ch children of our children of our children are here that we have a genetic claim and a genetic link to, and therefore we have responsibility and priority over them. And so some of what I understand, the breakdown of authority between what ET groups are allowed or, or to do what has somewhat to do with their genetic uh, legal ground authority, you know, to say, oh, oh, we have I see. authority over that person because he has this much of our DNA in him. And yeah. Yeah, so it, it gets very, very, very complicated. And so when you're saying about people, well, I, I have, I talk ETs and they're friendly, or I don't know, these ones are bad. That, yeah, the reason people can have such varied experiences on who their ET handlers are is because of the number of different species who are trying to do any number of different things. Uh, some may say, no, let's help them evolve, but really slowly so we don't freak them out. And others like, no, no, let's help them evolve much faster so they can get through this awkward period. No, 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 let's keep them, you know, the underclass so we can evolve the upper class and, you know, sort of have this stratified thing. So there's just a lot of different models of how you create an advanced civilization that are all trying to be implemented by people who've done it differently in different parts of the galaxy and said, well, we did it this way. So we think, you know, we should do it here this way. So you've got a lot of people telling us how we should build our civilization and what mm. state we should do and how, what kind of people should be included and what kind of eugenic project should be involved in creating those people. And you've got a lot of different opinions, and they, a lot of them don't agree. And so that's another reason why yeah. when I talk about the big picture, I call it the big cluster fudge because when you really start looking <laughs> yeah, at all, exactly. the, all the data, it's just a cluster fudge. It's just There's no order to it at all. It's really yeah. a lot of conflict and a lot of different sources of information yeah. and a lot of different sources of authority trying to do different things and act in different areas of command and control. And it gets really complicated. It's a cluster fudge. Yeah. Oh, I would imagine. I mean, they must think that the truth is, is dangerous because there's so much secrecy involved 
in all this and the compartmentalization that's so hard to find out the truth of some people's lives. They, all they know is they have these major mysteries in their lives and memory lapses and weird dreams and weird interferences and they just want to know the truth. They just want to know, like, why me? What the hell am I, you know? And it's Oh, yeah, I because... asked that question for years. Just asked yeah. that question for years and it was very frustrating. And the isolation is really hard. I mean, you know, just yeah. feeling like there's not another single human being in the world that you can talk to about what's happening to you is really isolating. Uh, and, it, and it's kind of the most isolating thing in the world. Like you will lock yourself in your house or your apartment or not speak to people for weeks or months at a time because you don't know what to say to them. Yeah. Or you start noticing things in other people where you still start to question, do they have a soul or are they really human or they just seem That's different. True. And uh, I don't know. Yeah. It's just That's a lot true. of unusual things. I'm curious, you know, the people who are your top, uh, com I guess, commanding officers and group, did they give you any kind of debriefing on the religious traditions and if they were bullshit and what was really true in terms of the history of the earth? And maybe they limited that information according to what your duties were. But I'm curious. I mean, they must know definitely a lot that we don't know, obviously, and, and know that maybe it's a bunch of crap. And of course, one of the things I wanted to ask, too, was um, in your tour of duty, there was a major conflict that resulted in the death of most of the people that you worked with, which was extremely traumatic, but it, it had to do with uh, wanting to retrieve some very sacred, ancient reptilian temple artifacts underground on Mars. And I'm wondering, you know, why and who decided to do that, and why are they so sacred, and what were they really, um, you know, what's part of this war really about in terms of... Yeah, what were they trying to find out, really? Do you know anything about the more details on that? or? Um, it's a very uncomfortable subject for me to talk about, but I'll see if I can answer a few questions okay. about that. Um, okay. So uh, certainly as a simple military um, series of objectives, you're dealing with an opponent who you want to gain information about or if you think that they have technology or resources or things which you can learn from, then you might want to take them and examine them and have your scientists, you know, thoroughly look them over and see if you can gain any actionable intelligence about it uh, or through it. Um, so sometimes, you know, we would get sent um, on, you know, sort of territorial raiding missions, which weren't typical. Typical ra territorial raiding missions involve sort of either protecting, you know, our division headquarters or invading someone else's sort of hive or lair or nest um, and sort of reducing their actionable uh, abilities to by a certain percentage and then leaving, you know, so just sort of reducing their effectiveness mm -hmm. by a certain mm -hmm. percentage and going away. It's yeah. what everybody, it's what I call this sort of on the ground sort of territorial uh, skirmishing was really about. Um, um, so, you know, we could be get sent to pick up an artifact or sometimes, yeah, go here and, you know, we wouldn't necessarily be fighting lots of people. It would be, oh, well, why are we here? Oh, there's an artifact of some kind or a weird egg or something strange and we would have to, you know, grab that thing and try and get away with it and sometimes get chased really fiercely uh, trying to run away with that thing and other times, you know, be good and stealthy and get in and get out fast. Um, the event which you're referring to um, is hard to say whether the command decision to go to this site was in fact true or false. So the uh, end orders to sort of go to this site and retrieve, um, you know, archaeological finds and or machinery or, you know, what was sometimes called uh, hard stuff, which sometimes just called hard stuff, anything that was hard physical material that we were mm -hmm. there to get. Um, and whether the order to do this was accurate, if that's what we were supposed to do, or whether this was a deliberate, um, like we were sent deliberately on a mission, on a suicide mission that was, you know, supposed to get yeah. everybody killed. Um, okay. that's, it's very mm -hmm. questionable and, and, and it's an emotional subject for me. So um, not knowing everything that I know about it, I suspect that it was some seriously wrong decisions or in fact a decision to just get rid of a bunch of people um, mm -hmm. by sending them to a location which, you know, we knew that the certainly actionable intelligence knew that there was no way that we were going to in and get out uh, alive. and. So, um, 
we um, – <clears throat> So uh, this was a, a mission that we went on with our sister division, uh, Division 097, we were Division 098, and, um, you know, which is over, gosh, almost, almost a thousand five, people? It, it, that, right. No, I'm sorry. You're right. It was, it was us and our sister division and um, uh, forward station Echo, which was the other two divisions there. So there were four, four divisions, right? There was almost a thousand people there. Um, and um, so, you know, we sort of maneuvered down these tunnels towards what we were told was this large sort of temple complex, uh, pretty large, you know, open sort of underground cave cathedral. You know, I'd call it that because it was looked like it was carved out, not so much like a natural cave uh, with a very, very high, you know, sort of a rounded dome, you know, ceiling that had, you know, it, it had a geometry to it, you know, the, the, the structure of whatever they used to, to carve out the ceiling or that was holding up the ceiling, um, you know, had kind of a geometric shape to it, but I'm not even sure I can describe it. Um, so we get into this very, very large, um, you know, cathedral cavern um, and what, you know, we're supposed to be looking for the hard stuff and, you know, just more and more people are filing into this, you know, chamber until there's like over a thousand of us in there and we're looking around going, well, we don't see it, you know, and we go to radio back in to HQ going, we don't see the hard stuff, you know, got any, you tell us that we, you know, another, another doorway or another chamber, another tunnel we're supposed to go from here. Uh, but communications were cut off at that time. We were not able to get through to HQ. Oh. We were not receiving information. And that was when everybody's stomach kind of sank and was like, oh, shit, this oh. is not good. Because you never want to get somewhere like that and then not be able to communicate and then lose communication. I kind of know that's a bad time. Um, so immediately we started trying to activate, you know, the localized wormhole so that we could just get out of there fast. That was being interfered with. They had some kind of technology that was shutting down our ability to activate the localized wormholes. So um, as we're communicating, trying to get the wormholes activated, kind of starting to panic because even though there's a thousand of us, you know, we're all in a one big room like rats in a trap. And so we didn't wow. really feel very confident about that. We weren't going to be we weren't going to be able to get back out. The tunnels were closing off behind us. Um, and in a weird say, when I say the tunnels closed behind us, they weren't like doors that dropped in the tunnels. Like the walls of the tunnels closed together, like a like an artery or a vein <laughs> closed up. There was no way you were going to get through there. Um, and so, as, within a very very short period of time, um, all these other doors or tunnels open around this chamber uh, in a you know in a circle around us and out of each one of these tunnels uh, starts coming a river of these uh, terrestrial reptoids, these galuka. And it uh, was, I mean, there, there may have been a thousand of us, but there must have been 10,000 of them. Uh, you know, they must have had us outnumbered 10 to 1 or something crazy like that. And they just basically started coming in, flowing in, you know, kind of like water in a circle, and then were forming a spiral uh, as they kept moving around and around and around in a circular motion around us, keeping in mind that as they're doing that, each of them has a very large, sharp bladed weapon of some kind in their hand. So uh, I often refer to this event as the blender and not in any kind of a nice uh -huh. kind way. I mean, we were caught in a blender and people were just getting cut to ribbons. Uh, and the outer circle was just getting cut up, cut up, cut up, cut up. And we just started pulling in and trying to retreat center and trying to fight, you know, sort of keep the line, which wasn't working at all because we just couldn't defend against being outnumbered by a bunch of guys with very sharp wow. objects. So uh, really what was less than five minutes, ten minutes, I mean, what was not a very long period of time at all, um, you know, and the numbers, that thousand number was just being whittled down and down and down and down, you know, by the wow. 100 people, you know, uh, of every few seconds. Um, and wow. finally, finally, someone managed to get through uh, on an alternate communication frequency 
and was communicating with HQ, and HQ was saying, we're working on it. We're working on something to get you out of there right now. And we were like, well, it better be in the next five minutes or we're all going to be dead. Um, so what they managed to do was instead of using the localized wormhole uh, teleport uh, technology, they used a large-scale ship wormhole uh, generator to that would basically be a wormhole generator that you'd move a ship through. So wow. as we're so as we're being surrounded and being cut up all of a sudden this large wormhole appears right over the top of our heads um, and drops over the top of us so that we get pulled right through it. And anyone caught in the event horizon, though, of that wormhole was, you know, just sheared in half. So uh, mm -hmm. that was pretty pleasant. So the next thing I know, we're on the deck of a medical platform um, you know, with people, a few people standing, most people lying on the ground with body parts missing and cut in half. And Oh, wow. <sighs> yeah, and I just, you yeah. know, started screaming medic, medic, and yeah, that was, uh, I, I refer to that as the second worst day ever because I lost yeah. everybody that day. It was very, <sighs> it was it was yeah, horrible. did you get injured in that one as well? I was, I was very lucky. I was really at the middle uh, sort of like, you know, if we're in this big oblong, you know, crowd, I was really in the middle when it all started to happen. So as, you know, the outer ring is starting to just close in, I was really at one of the most center, most points. Uh, so just through sort of sheer luck or fate or whatever, you know, I was one of the few, 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 few people that survived. I don't know exactly how many people survived because I was ushered away from that facility uh, pretty quickly oh. after I was medically treated. I don't know what happened to everybody after that. There are people who I think might still be alive or might have lived through that that I knew very, oh. very well that I never got to see after that, and I have no idea what happened. But there were less yeah, than that. 35, you know, people on that platform. So, you know, out of a 1,000 or so people who were there, you know, less than 35 of them made it out alive. Yeah, so did the other 35 end up going to a different assignment like you did? Um, I have you no went idea. Because you to the USS Nautilus. Yeah. I have no idea. Yeah, I got I got promoted. I got to go to flight school, and then I got, I got uh, yeah, stationed on the Nautilus and airwing on the Nautilus. But I have no idea what happened to everybody. It was a very tragic moment, but, which I still yeah. have a hard time with. Wow. Yeah. It sounds pretty tragic. And not very many survivors. So No. Yeah. No, I, yeah, like I said, I I don't like thinking about it, and I don't like talking about it. Yeah, and I, yeah, that's, that's about all I yeah. want to say. So the USS the the USS Nautilus was that like a spaceship or a regular ship, uh, naval uh, ship type? The the EDF SS Nautilus, which stands for Earth Defense Force Starship Nautilus, is a um, an IG Highliner class. The IG stands for Intergalactic uh, Highliner class. A, the, the designations, as I mostly understand them, you're either an IG something or a IS something, and the IG stands for intergalactic, and the IS would stand for intrasolar. So vehicles that are oh. sort of limited to solar system travel uh, are of a designation of an IS for intrasolar, and anything that's designated as an intergalactic vehicle has an IG designation in front of it. So these large what I call it a carrier vehicle carrier ship uh, it's called a Highliner class or an IG Highliner class and this was one of those like it was the EDF SS Nautilus uh, which had several air wings uh, attached to it um, and mm. a command section in the front and engine section in the back and we mostly tooled around the solar system and patrol 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 wow. patrol, patrol patrol the most I mean I, I really I mean, I love to fly, and flying in space in a ship is one of the coolest things ever. But if I'm really to, like, remember most of what I happened to remember as a pilot, it was just a lot of boring patrolling, boring, boring, boring patrols, uh, um, which is, not, and again, not a bad thing, but uh, just so much of that time, you know, every day. Our, our job as pilots, every day, you know, you for a certain number of hours, you get in your – vehicles and you fly and you do patrols and then you come in and someone else comes yeah. out and does patrols and you've got so many air wings doing so many patrols over so many sectors doing long range scans blah 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 so it's a lot of just so, sort of boring mundane kind of flying around you know not doing much of anything exciting as opposed to so you this know, 17 ship, years was of, this of like on the, the ground you know blood knuckling and stuff 
Yeah, so the ship that you were on, did it look like a classic uh, UFO spacecraft, or what was its design? Can you describe it? Like if we saw it um, in the air, what would it look like? Yeah, no, no, it's it's like a long cylinder, you know, like a really long oh, okay. cylinder. I, I, I want to say like, you know, I mean, gosh, I think I... I want to say it was somewhere between, you know, like almost a almost a half a mile long, you know, from oh, nose to tail. Pretty big. Pretty good size. Yeah. Pretty good size. I mean, pretty big. Um, I wonder how long we've had that kind of technology in terms of humans. Like how long we've had those kinds of ships. I don't know that off the top of my head, but I could ask if you want to know. I mean, I could get that information for you if you yeah. really want to know. Yeah, because obviously we got the technology from somewhere, and, and it's been oh, going yeah. on for a while, you know. And yeah. one wonders, too. I mean, I've had a people soldier tell me that, you know, he was one of his jobs was actually to help abduct humans for other projects that were in collusion with aliens and humans using craft that, you know, humans were on. And that they, I guess, in order to work, they had to pledge their life to do that. And sometimes they would actually fake their deaths on Earth and then use a clone body to chip, kill the clone body and then use the real one as the real service in the breakaway civilization. But well, whether or not sounds, that's true, yeah. I, I don't oh, know. No, that, that yeah. sounds completely in line with what I understand to be pro secrecy protocols, clone protocols, and so forth. Yeah, that sounds completely uh, in line with what I know. Yeah. Although I've heard, you know, I don't know if you've told me that, that you don't think the clone soldiers work as well, and that that's a different subject than maybe what we ever discuss, that the clone bodies don't do as well, or the clone soldiers don't do as well, or they, I don't know. Well, <laughs> what certainly... Was it? <laughs> No, no, Cl clones uh, are, are essentially, from what I understand, to make a clone, it has to have this teeny, 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 tiny fraction of your soul to live, uh, which is okay. why apparently you have to use someone who has a soul to make clones of them. That, that's the first criteria. Okay. There. Uh, and yeah. that you have a, a limited number of clones that you can make of that person at any one time. Because apparently not now, and apparently this is like a natural law of the universe that, that uh, in you know physics that I don't completely understand. But apparently this is written into the codex of the universe. You can only make so many clones of something at one time, and then if you try and make another a one extra, uh, it won't take. It simply the cells won't take. They won't uh, cohese. They won't grow. Yeah. There's, there's a natural order that says mm. no. Nope, you've taken this many teeny fractions of your soul to make a clone, and nope, no more. You can take no more than that. So there is some sort yeah. of natural law to that, but I don't exactly know what it is. Um, but uh, if, if yeah. you're using a clone <clears throat> for a very short period of time, uh, and it's very, very heavily monitored, very, very heavily programmed, very, very heavily controlled, you can kind of keep the behavior in line. But when you want to make clone soldiers or use clones as like cannon fodder soldiers. They're very difficult to train. They're very stupid. They're oh. very undisciplined. And they're really, really difficult. And I know I've brought this up before, talking about the clone dogs, that if you, you know, go on the internet and look for the companies that will clone your dog or the dogs, the hero dogs that they've cloned, there's some oh, interesting wow. stories uh, about these, but not one follow-up story on, you know, what happened with these puppies. On how are these clone puppies wow, doing? Wow, I've are never heard. Are people having no. behavior wow. problems with them? Are they having, you know, scratching and puppies. problems? But you can't, there's not Just one kidding. story following up on the behavior of these clone puppies. So I find that very interesting, and I would be really curious to know wow. how they're doing. Uh, because I would, be, I would think that yeah. maybe you'd have the same problem with them, that they would be, have discipline problems well, and behavior you know, problems. I wonder. Yeah, I mean, I know Malanga had found through his regressions of abductees that, Indeed, that every abductee actually has a clone or their material is stored so that they could grow up a clone. And he didn't call them clones, though. He called them copies. <clears throat> and they use these copies in order to store on what he called the active alien memory, which is like a, a parasite that they install inside the brain slash mind. And then they use a clone to copy that because that's how they maintain the consciousness of these aliens to live through us somehow. But the clones always use like a sold person. So one of the, actually one of the procedures in the FMS was to destroy the clones, and you apparently could do this by connecting to your, you know, your higher self basically, and then right. by willpower you you disconnect by intention to disconnect from the clones. So you could destroy the clones, 
because the whole idea was that if, if the copies were still out there, they could still access you and abduct you. And if you don't want to be abducted anymore, you got to kill the clones. <laughs> but um, whether or not that's they, really true in practice, I don't know if you've observed that, like clones just well, dying or strange there's, things. There's a certain mm -hmm. amount of that theory that, that I think is, is very correct and, and other of it, which I'm just not sure of. Um, but definitely the notion of being able to, uh, you know, send a copy, you know, you know, sort of re use, use a copy to replace for a person while you're doing something with them or you've got them off somewhere yeah. and then earning right. them. Um, now, when I first heard that, it was, um, it, it, he clued in a memory of something that happened that oh. made me think back and go, oh, that makes that make complete sense. So um, I'll tell you yeah. an incident when I was, uh, I'll try and tell it very quickly. When I was a very small child, I want to say maybe six years old, um, uh -huh. there was an event that occurred. And um, so, well, let me put it, I'll sort of put it chronologically how I remember it happening. So I'm like six years old and we've got some other kids in the neighborhood. You know, we all sort of get together and play some different varying ages. I was probably one of the younger of the kids. Most of the other kids were between seven and nine or something like that. Um, and, you know, we're coming out in the middle of the street to play and, you know, we were all going to go over to Tommy's house and we were going to go into the garage or something. And I like, everyone kind of looks at me and Tommy, you know, gets down and points his finger. It's like, no, you're not allowed in the garage anymore after what happened last time. And I was what like, what was that? And I was like, what do you mean what happened last time? And, um, they were like, well, no, you were messing with my dad's drill. And so my dad said, you're not allowed to come in the garage anymore. And I, I stood there and I ended up crying my eyes out. Like, no, I didn't. I never did that. That didn't happen. No, that didn't happen. I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know. That didn't happen. I don't know what you mean. Um, and I'm like, I I'm only six, but to the point where they're going, yes, it is. Yes, it is. And I'm just in tears running away going, no, it didn't. No, it didn't. Um, and then about two weeks later, this is the interesting part, sort of waking up from the dream where I remember going into the garage and he's got, uh, his dad had his drill uh, like mounted in a, in, a, in a vice he was doing something with. And I went up and I pushed the button and then ran away. And so, you know, just the <laughs> motor set off or whatever. And so I just pushed the button and then run away. Um, and then I was like, oh. Now I remember that, but how come I didn't remember that before and not even for the last two weeks? And I've been thinking about it. Like, it's like, I was like, wait a minute. They keep saying I did to some, push the button on the drill, but I don't remember doing that. And even though I was only like six years old, I was obsessing over how in the world can everybody think that I did something that I know I didn't do because I didn't remember it. And it mm -hmm. clued in this thing when I was remembering it. Ow, oh, that's because it was my copy. I didn't remember what my copy oh. did. So, and until they integrated the copy memory with my other memory, yeah. and those memories were integrated that I remembered that this thing that my copy did. But that's so why I was insistent that there's no way I did that. I couldn't have done that. And I even, you know, was stomping on my foot going, no, I didn't. And, you know, running away crying because I didn't. I didn't do it. I didn't remember it. My copy did it. And, um, but wow. no one else yeah. is going to know that. No one else is going to know the difference between you and your copy. As far as they're concerned, you did it. So when he did say that, it did key that memory in of remembering yeah. that experience. And, it was, and that enabled me to put some sense to that in a way that I could never put sense to that. Okay. Or like, yeah. how could I wow. have remembered, not remembered something, and then having been there, and then remembered it two weeks later, it was all very weird. And that, yeah. that just made that make sense. Or it's like a flashback. Yeah, you'll remember it later. And that... I know Malanga had several reports of that kind of thing where they had to catch up with the memory and then it would come back and they have to have bits and pieces. They have to have everything coherent or it won't work right. <laughs> but they do right, make right. mistakes or, or, or you end up going together. around and people going, hey, how come you weren't, how come you hit Joey on Friday? Well, I didn't hit Joey on Friday. I mean, yeah, otherwise you're just going to be completely <laughs> confused and denying yeah. what people are telling you happened. That's so, going to uh, cause our time you know, is actually to take so, notice of things. You don't want people taking notice of things. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, we're running short on time. I think our time is about up. So is there anything else that you'd like to say about, um, like, your new website that you're putting together or your, I don't know, if your new business you're starting or anything else that you'd like to share before we wrap it up? Um, 
I, I, I'm working on my website. It's uh, earthcitizenconsulting.org, um, and it should be up sometime within the next um, week or so here. I'm, I really am, like, oh. almost ready to publish the site and have something minimally operating up and going that people can contact me and send emails and so forth. And I just want to emphasize that as soon as that is up, um, people who have questions, I'm really, really happy to answer questions, especially people who are having issues or having personal issues. I understand that it's you, it's really hard to have a therapist or a doctor who can sort it out yeah. with you. It's hard to have a friend who can sort it out with you. And I maybe can't help, and maybe I can't help sort it out, but I will. I want to make sure that I'm available to help okay. people walk through this process yeah. in any way that I can because I feel like if one person had been there who could have helped me walk through this process, it wouldn't have taken as long. It just wouldn't have yeah, taken as long. Right. So if I can reduce the amount of years that it takes anybody to sort through this, I'm really happy to do that. Um, okay. I also know well, that there are yeah. people in official capacity who go on to ask me questions, and I want to encourage anybody in the legislative or executive process or anybody in the military who wants a briefing from me, I will do that in private. Wow, that's that's a lot there. That that is so. My uh, command wanna... has made it very clear mm -hmm. what they want me to do, and they think that there is a real breakdown of communication uh, between what is supposed to be the you know information flowing from the covert programs to the main branches of the executive and the legislative branches of government, and that that's not mm -hmm. happening. That hasn't been happening for a while, and they've encouraged me to be willing to bridge that gap and speak to those people and try and get them on the right page and try and get them the right information wow. to make the right decisions and make the right choices and do the right things. Well, that's that's a big chunk there. So I really appreciate you sharing so much and also your chain of command for even allowing you to share. It's pretty amazing, actually. So um, I don't think well, we have much I, I time either, left. If I say it once, I'll say it again. My chain of command feels that they have done everything they can from their position to you know, complain up their chain of command, and they have gotten so much negative results and no results that they're like, we have no choice but to do this now. We have no choice but to throw someone out there and say, you know, tell the truth and go with this because we can't get any action through the normal chain of command that they, they have. Yeah. They're trying to – like a grass people operation them, now. Hey, we don't yeah. like it this way. You should do it differently, and they're not getting results. So – they're telling me that okay. because of the blocks of access of information that I am free and uh, fully endorsed and allowed to give briefings to anybody that I feel needs them. And I feel that people in government, legislative, executive branches, and in, even in the operational branches of the military who are going to be offered okay. up as sacrificial lambs uh, need good briefings, and I'm happy to do that. Wow. Okay. So uh, is there any – I guess there's not an email that you want to put out. You'll, that'll be on your website when it's up and running. So, um, actually, um, I, you know, I, I can actually I'm using the email that I'm using now, which is Captain K, uh, which is C A P T A I N K A E Y with the numbers four 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 at uh, Gmail, my email address. So I'm people okay. can uh, send me emails if they want to. I'm happy to talk to people. Okay, great. Well, I really appreciate you sharing, and I want to thank you very much. Um, this is Eve Lorgan, and we're. We're going to end our interview now, so I just want to say thank you, and uh, hopefully we can share again. Thank you very much for having me. It was great. My okay. pleasure.